and welcome back or welcome to the On Coaching Podcast. I'm Steve Magnus, joined as always by my good friend and colleague, John Marcus. John, what's going on, my man? Steve, you know why we're here. We're here to give the people what they want, and we're giving them lots of money off the Scholar Program until the end of October. $10 off when you use the coupon code going in your exclamation point. I mean, come on. I mean, get that stuff. All I'm saying is this. So I got a, I got an email this week from someone who said, hey, I've been listening to the podcast for a really long time, <laughs> said I've hesitated on the Scholar program, and then I heard the Mike Smith tapes, and I was like, okay, I'm going to sign up for one month. And then she said, I made a mistake, and I was like, oh, gosh, here we go. I realized I should have signed up for the yearly membership because this shit is a gold mine <laughs> yes <laughs> and i kid you not like that's what the email said and i'm like i made a mistake <laughs> love it i'm like just just like i'm never gonna get through all of this stuff like it's an unending gold mine and i'm like this these are my people you yeah. got it you got hey, it mike smith has an annual membership so if you're a better coach than mike smith and you're not a scholar and you don't haven't pulled the trigger on the annual membership. Well, by all means, go out coach him because this is where he gets a lot of intel that helps influence his decision making. That's right. That's right. And we've got new courses, new we've got scholar program stuff coming up, our our monthly mastermind, all that good stuff. We're just we're just cranking here with good coaches. So if you want to get on board, get on now before the discount goes away and get the rest of the Mike Smith types. I'm just mm. telling you. There it is. There it is. It's good stuff. So, you know, we're going to kind of give you a preview kind of what we do in the Scholar Program because we're going deep today, John. We're so going deep. We can go hard. We go deep and hard. Like, there's no reason to go this deep and hard, but that's what we do because we that's what the people want. <laughs> that's right. So this is the kind of content you get in the pro program. We go, go deep and hard on this stuff. And today we're going over... The Norwegian model of lactate threshold training. In in okay, so let's let's set the scene here. Everybody knows the Inger Ritsens, right? Jakob, Henrik, their father, all this stuff. They have their own TV show, their kind of reality TV show in Norway. Running nerds break it apart. Everyone's like the let's look at the Inger Britson training, Inger Britson training. And one of the things that people often notice is the the very controlled threshold training that they do, right? They say, oh, look at all their threshold training. This is unique, et cetera, et cetera. And it is. But you know what? We're, we're not going to start with Ingebrigtsen's when we talk about Norwegian threshold training. We're not, because that's not where it came from. So let me start with a story. Way back when John and I were athletes and just getting into coaching, there was this website hosted by world-class runner. He was a 13.05K runner named Marius Backen. In the pre-Super Show era. Pre-Super Show. What the F? 13 O's. <laughs> okay. Some random white dude when, when no offense, nobody was good. Like you had, you had Bob Kennedy and then there was this gap and you're just like, who the, like, we all suck. You know, mm -hmm. this was during the era for um, those nerds the there was that movie that came out that was uh 5, meters nothing else matters oh yeah which was a look at americans trying to just simply <laughs> hit the standard <laughs> just trying to get yeah and, just... and and basically if you hit the standard you were on the world championship uh you know olympic team all that good stuff and and, and that's all it took because Man, we, all those vo2 thought, max intervals come on let's go vo2 max let's go that's all. And the standard wasn't very hard back then, you know, comparatively. I don't remember exactly, but it was, it was something like 1330, like, 1335. Yeah, yeah, it was like not that hard. So what ha now we have all sorts of college kids hit it, even in the pre super shoe era. Mm -hmm. So what there was is, again, in the early 2000s, Mary's back in. He actually came out of spending a year at York High School training under the legendary Joe Newton. Okay. Yeah. Nope. Trained trained under Peter Co for a, a couple years. Yes, Le that's that's pretty cool. Yes, legendary coach of so Sebastian Co. Obviously, um, and then what he found, what really gave him this breakthrough, was this threshold training. 
And then the early 2000s, again, I'm setting the stage for maybe younger listeners, is that there was no big, like you had, there was no big training repository. There was no scholar program. You had to hunt to find what everybody was doing. You had to hunt to find what was u- new and unique. Your only resources were essentially Peter Coe's book, you know, Better Training for Distance Runners, which you devoured. And and like occasionally you looked at, you know, Jack Daniels, what he was putting out, and that was kind of it. And in this in this space, Mary's back in started a website that just tracked and told the world what he was doing. And it was all on kind of message boards, <laughs> his own message board on his own website. So you it was were basically per- like his own clubhouse. <laughs> yeah, it was his own clubhouse. <laughs> yeah. And you, you, you just peruse through this message board where everyone is just like l- waiting to see what Marius says on his training. And the reason I set the stage is Marius was experimenting with lactate threshold training in a new and unique way. And the best way that I could put it, which John, you you mentioned uh, offline, is he was kind of like the Canova before Canova, before Canova came big on on the message boards and all that stuff, where he was like, I'm experimenting, I'm showing you all this stuff, here's what we do. It was radically different. And guess what? Fast forward a couple decades, you know who Ingerbrit sends, who their father calls when when he's starting the journey with all of his son and like daily weekly like peppering this guy with questions day in and day out marius back yes yeah he calls him and he says tell me everything you did that worked right uh, that worked and that was their starting point right and what are the mistakes yeah exactly what were the mistakes that that is where the Inger Britson model, the foundation of it comes from. So what we're going to try and talk about today is we're going to go back in the time machine a little bit mm-hmm. and tell you a little bit about the Norwegian model of threshold training through the lens of, of Marius Backen. And to, to get one thing that I want to set the stage and I'm going to turn it over to you, John, is that I just looked back at my notes. I'm pulling back notes from decades ago. And one of the things I had highlighted, because I got a Marius back in document. This is how nerdy I was. And he said, this shows what he was doing different. As a general rule, around 30% of your total mileage should be lactate threshold running. And once you get used to it, you can increase it some. And that, that, you know, that sets the stage where you're like, oh, man. Yeah, he was doing something different. Like he was pushing this threshold and he was also pushing it in a different way than what we in the US are used to seeing as threshold training. So I'll leave that there. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, threshold is still, still a very misunderstood concept by so many coaches and athletes. I, you know, I, I think, Steve, we should just write the tome on what it is and what it isn't because people are still confused about it to this day. We have to go back further, though, right? Because here's the reality is Peter Coe is the origin and genesis for Marius Backen, right? Joe Newton, heavily influenced by Coe, obviously, very deep relationship. So Joe Newton understood these things um, that was going on, whether it was tactically or subconsciously, he had an intuition about it through his interaction with Co. Pass it down to the athletes he worked with, and then Co. Right. One one cool thing about Marius Backen's website is there's letters he's posted of PDFs of letters from Co. Training letters because that's how they communicated. Co. would write him a letter and be like, "Okay, yeah, this is good. That's not good." And this started him on the journey of understanding this concept of anaerobic threshold, right? And this is that era when. We thought there was a thing called oxygen jet when we thought lactate was bad. It created acidity, lactic acid, and you had your anaerobic work. And I was like, oh, don't touch that. Uh, don't do too much of that because oof, that stuff burns you out. And then we had the, you know, quote unquote, aerobic work, right? And everyone's super confused. But we have to go even a further step back to Lydiard, right? Lydiard is the one who introduced 100-mile weeks of what we call – Today, 
high-end or aerobic threshold running as the precursor before other blocks of training. The godfather of block periodization in running, right? All we're going to do is just this one thing and this one thing only. But you have to also remember, right, his recommendation was to build these athletes up to 100 miles a week of high-end aerobic running. So we're talking an hour and 90 minutes per day of this. Plus, plus they ran two recovery runs in the morning and mid-afternoon of legitimate oxidative recovery. So they're, these guys are running three times a day if you're counting all the miles, right? And he counts all the miles. He goes, oh, yeah, if we count every step that they took, it's Pete Snell probably ran, if you count every step, 150 to 170 miles a week. But he didn't really count that 50 to 70 miles of aerobic, or I mean, of the oxidative recovery as training. It was just a supplemental thing that you did. <laughs> so again, we, we have this counting problem, right? Where we nowadays we count everything as a mile and it has equal import. And when you stop and you think about, okay, during the marathon base training phase, this half miler is running 170 miles a week. A hundred of it is at this high end aerobic threshold, right? And then other, another 50 to 70 is at this oxy of recovery. Like you're like, whoa, this is crazy. But then we have to go even a step back further, Stephen, to Igloy <laughs> and Bob Shul. And you look at what Igloy had Bob Shul and those guys do. So early on in their training, they would run in the mornings about 90 minutes at a very slow oxy of recovery pace. Then come back mid morning late morning for a flux essentially style workout interval workout on the track where we're spiking lactate letting it subside spiking and then come back in the afternoon and those sessions also ran about 60 to 90 minutes so when i tell people they're not working hard enough they're legitimately not working hard enough <laughs> but we think we are because you're strava or whatever blah 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 and these are all people with full-time jobs so they're, good. they're waking up early in the morning, running 90 minutes easy, going to work, lunch break, going to run this interval workout. After work, going to go then run this other interval workout. And so you see the same effect with Bob Shule closing 37 in the Tokyo 5K on cinders, which is insane. <laughs> because again, he's not, as they would say at the time, he's not an oxygen debt. He's not anaerobic. He's not quote unquote lactic. So this whole like... When you step back and you look at our historical orientation and understanding about what's going on, people hit it and they hit it right in the right way and they knew what was going on, but they didn't necessarily know what was going on. What Marius Backen did was he gave scientific language and precision to exactly what was going on through the lens of this lactate threshold training. I love it. And I'm going to give you I'm going to give you some evidence here. Okay, because I'm just I just I'm just going through my Marius back and document. <laughs> okay, this is this and you got to remember, like this is one of Steve's like Steve. When I said, "Hey, this is the topic," he's like, "His eyes lit up." He's like, "Oh yeah," because if you read Science of Running, right, Marius yeah. back and one of his biggest influences. He names it right there in the book. That's right. So let's let's do this. This is Marius writing. I don't know when, 2003, probably something like that, right? Mister Coe's book for periodiz. <laughs> Re here, use Mr. Coe's book for periodization and general fitness, but quote unquote, ignore his very hard anaerobic work for the most part and lack of mileage. But notice that he wants a long distance runner to do four to five threshold runs a week. See the table on page whatever per week, per week, <laughs> then read Lydiard and mix the two of them and you will have great training. Yes. <laughs> I, I mean, it, I mean, it's it's like it's very simple. Like we're tying those things together where it's like if you realize again, this is what they're they're Again, back. It was coached by Co. What he's saying is like, yeah, you read the book like Co talks about low lower mileage. But most of that essentially is because they didn't count the recovery mileage. No. And that's the other thing. Like this is the thing people have to remember is a lot of people didn't count jogging recovery miles yeah. as training they yeah. didn't so we and then you look at it and you're like oh snap they're throwing down five to eight hours a week of this type of 
quote unquote training, which is not training, but recovery. Yes, it, <laughs> exactly. It, exactly. So I, I think that is, again, like one of the things that we often mistake or miss out here. Now, I want to talk about, okay, we kind of set the stage. I want to talk about, well, why would Marius and Peter Co say four to five threshold runs a week? Like, are you kidding me? Like, no one can do that. Well, this is the innovation that was started with, you know, can go all the way back to Igloy, as you said. What was Igloy doing? <laughs> right? What was Igloy doing? Was uh, Well, if you look at his training, you look, you're like, oh, there's intervals every every day, essentially. Well, no, no, no. He was dosing it so that he was getting some of this high-end aerobic work, threshold work, and interval style, you know, basically all the time. And here's here's the part where this is, you know, if you go back, you read Peter Coe's book, Better Training for Distance Runners, Coe and Martin, you will see this chart that says four to five threshold runs a week. And this is the make, mistake we now make. We generally see that and we say, oh, like a workout is a workout. So that means four to five days where I'm just focused on threshold. But that's not what he meant. It's not what Backen meant. What they meant was four to five stimuluses of it. Okay. So this is key. So, and the reason this has gotten lost is because, you know, again, not to discredit the guy, but Jack Daniels and others push to see like workouts through a single zone. So we do, what do we do? Today we do a VO2 max workout. It's all focused VO2 max. Six by 800 is that VO2 max, three minutes less. Next day we do a threshold, or two days later we do a threshold workout. It's all focused on threshold. We're going 25 minutes at threshold, call it a day. Then two days later. What what Co Backen and others were saying is like, whoa, whoa, whoa here. We need to count. We can mix and blend things so that we're getting these stimuluses multiple times. And this this is the key, is if you look at Ingerbritsen now, if you look at back and then, what did they do? Well, their threshold work often isn't the classic go run a 25-minute threshold or tempo or what have you. Often what it is, is it's broken up, fartlek style or interval style, kind of similar to Igloy style, all I'm saying. And it's often done in multiple different sessions during that day or spread out where they do a little bit of threshold and then a little bit of something else. So what you often see would see is maybe threshold work in the morning where you're doing, I don't know, we'll just make up things like five by five minutes. And then in the afternoon threshold work where you're doing, I don't eight by three minutes, right? Plus some other stuff. And you're kind of doubling up on this threshold run, threshold work to get this bigger bang for your buck, which is what ultimately allows you to come back to that back and stuff at the beginning, ultimately allows you to get up to that 25, 30% of your mileage, which back in was recommending at that point. Yeah, I'm, Steve, I'm really glad you said that because it's a misinterpretation and then a misapplication of what we call block style training. So it's actually like if you're just doing threshold or just doing VO2 mix or just doing speed and that's the whole session, that's it. That's a blocked session where we're only focusing on essentially trying to, you know, encourage a stimulus and then eventually adaptation on one uh, quality. But that's exactly what not to do, <laughs> because then you start thinking in very rigid and regimented ways. And when you think with that degree of rigidity, you start to become inflexible. And so then we start to gravitate towards there's only one way to dose this. And that's what all we're talking about. We are talking about dosage. We're talking about micro dosing stimuli and we're talking about adaptation time horizons. Right. The best way to like think about this is like just think about alcohol. If you drink three beers every night for about, you know, three weeks, your body will adapt to a point where like it won't get buzzed on the three beers. But if you only drink three beers once every 10 days, your body can't adapt to it because the stimulus is too infrequent, right? The time under tension, as they call it in the weight room, is not frequent enough. It's like a stress 
And then all these stress hormones come in to kind of like repair all the inflammation that happened. And that's it. That's the end of it. It's like, oh, okay. Oh, thank God we don't have to deal with that again. But then you kind of have this really infrequent exposure to the stimulus. There's really no adaptation, that long longitudinal adaptation that takes place. It's just stress and then recovery from a stress and then, you know, back to homeostasis. In order to alter your homeostatic disposition, the stress needs to be habitual. It needs to be frequent. And then you need to take this moment to kind of recover. And this is the problem with the supercompensation model, right? And why the Norwegians, um, you know, are really astute on this. Uh, it's even in speed skating, right? I, you know, recently read How to Skate a 10K, also a half 10K by uh, Niels van der Poel, the uh, world record holder in the 10K, which is 12 minutes on ice and 5k, which is about six minutes on ice and gold, uh, gold medalist. And then he talks about the appropriate kind of what they call impact loading and then taper where you really, you know, Jerry calls these medium dig cycles where like almost every day or every other day, you're fucking hitting it really hard for about six to 12 days. And then you just chill. You don't do anything. You just allow the absorption or adaptation to happen. We think in two small time horizons. We think of workout to workout or day to day. These guys aren't thinking day to day. They're thinking, you know, block to block. And most blocks are somewhere between two to four weeks. So what's the difference in your homeostasis if we apply the stimulus over and over and over and over again in block to block, two to four weeks horizons versus weekly, once a week. And that's what's happening. Like we think we're doing this aerobic threshold training and we are doing, getting a stimulus if we're doing one threshold, 20 minute tempo a week. Sure. But we're not getting necessarily training that encourages a longitudinal adaptation. Exactly. I think that's, that's spot on and that's a good way to kind of put it. And I just want to harp on this. Okay. So we get it. You know, the listeners like, okay, we get it like more thresholds, like more frequently. Well, you might say, well, that, that just seems impossible. Like even if we split it up instead of doing the, uh, you know, 25 minutes or what have you. Well, again, I'll go to b back and experimented with even up to half of his training being this kind of threshold high end aerobic stuff said when I was running a hundred miles a week, I 50 miles of, of threshold high end aerobic in a week was possible which is a lot of volume of this stuff. The key thing, though, is this. When we talk about threshold or high-end aerobic or whatever we want to call it, often in the U.S., we think of riding right on that line. Yeah. So the, the Daniels model is like, find your threshold, ride it. Right. right. If we use the four, if we use the millimo model and let's say the average is four, yeah. then people are like, all right, you want to ride at 3.98 to 3.99. <laughs> like right there. Don't go to four, but just right there. <laughs> right. Right. It, 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 exactly. Right. But listen to what uh, Marius Backen says. He says, and I'm paraphrasing and then I'll get to the quote. Most people get it wrong. Like they think of, of staying right at that four millimole mark, but the best training is right below your lactate threshold between 0.5 and 1.0 millimoles lactate mm -hmm. below your threshold or approximately 10 heartbeats below. Okay. And the reason is remember, and I'm quoting, remember that training right at the threshold breaks down your body much. Yes. Much more than right below. This must be emphasized. The effect of running below the threshold is much greater. Mm -hmm. So what he is saying here is one of the reasons, right? One of the reasons that they're able to do this much work at these high end aerobic intensities is because they're saying, don't ride that line. Be a little bit below and then that allows you to get the frequency of work without the breakdown so that you can handle, again, these double threshold sessions, these other sessions, et cetera. And when you do that, you know, you don't get the breakdown, you get the benefit. And this is the missed 
again, another misunderstood and misapplied concept of the polarized training model or 80-20 model that's put forth kind of by the Steven Siler camp, right? Because you look at this model and it goes, oh, wait, we're in the gray zone. Oh, what? No, not good. It's like, um, look, guys, it's way effing more complicated than that. That's why I kind of, you know, critique that where it's like, what we're talking about with thresholds is we have to understand too, you know, if, you know, on Brooks's research and everything, lactate has also demonstrated to be an accelerant to recovery. Let me say this again. Lactate has also been demonstrated through scientific research to be an accelerant to the recovery process, not enhance it, quicken it. Mind blown, right? So, but what happens is if you're riding what we call that anaerobic threshold, really close to it, there's a host of other really you know, radical chemical metabolic breakdowns that happen too, that are corrosive. And those include the releasing of hormones, right? Like cortisol and norepinephrine and things of that nature. So like that can quote unquote fry the system. And that's what's frying the system, right? Is actually these hormones release, they're catabolic in nature. And now they're flooded in the body because we're doing this too high end of work, too frequently or too much of it. And so then to dissipate that hormonal uh, catabolic um, release t- requires a lot more time to, you know, um, recover. The old timers just call it your nerve energy, your oh, your nerves. Like, and that's what they were really talking about was this hormonal release that happens that can, in in concert with it because your body recognizes. And the best way to do it, right? And we t- you talk about this in science and running, Steve. We talk about often the best way to modulate or understand that is very simple. It's through the quote unquote talk test or listening to your respiration, right? When you start to have to breathe through your mouth excessively and panting like that, and too much carbon dioxide is needing to get out of the body, that's a clear sign that it changes the nervous system's response from more of a homeostatic, manageable, parasympathetic, sympathetic balance, or what we call flow. And it then goes to high end fight or flight, sympathetic. Oh my God, what the F slow down. You're going insane. And that triggering into that overly sympathetic state is what triggers the hormonal release. Cause going too sympathetic means your body's like ready for fight or flight. So now it's going to give you this cascade of hormones to get you ready, right? The shock uh, phenomena that happens where people get super strength for a small acute period of time. But it comes with a price. It comes with an inflammatory price. And so now your whole system has these hormones. Inflammation has gone way up. And why? Because you continue to try to force your body to run a pace that was told to you, even though your breathing was like, <laughs> like a dog panting, right? When that starts to happen, that's how you know you have crest that threshold, <laughs> right? And I always tell people it's it's pretty simple. What Mary's back in was advocating and the difference between the anaerobic threshold and aerobic threshold is when you're in that gray area and let's just pretend it's on average two millimoles for the aerobic threshold and four millimoles for the anaerobic threshold. When you're in that gray area, breathing is controlled and you're in control of it, but it's focused. So if below the aerobic threshold, what we call pure oxidative recovery is modulated or um, uh, understood by it's breathing through your nose, right? As soon as you ha- are compelled to breathe through your mouth, you've crest that first threshold. You've crest that aerobic threshold. And that's okay. It's controlled breathing through the mouth. You know, maybe it's a couple nasal breaths followed by a couple exhalations through the mouth, what have you. But as soon as it becomes, we're breathing through your nose to get the required amount of oxygen in or out becomes non-negotiable. You can't do it. You'll feel like you'll pass out and faint and die on the spot. That's when you know you've crossed the anaerobic threshold. And that's the spot to stay away from. So what Mary Spackham was saying, okay, look, we're going to step even further and be in between. So it'll be like maybe two or three like nasal breaths followed by one or two mouth breaths and exhalations. And it's finding that quote unquote moderate sweet spot, which allows the continuation or accumulation of this um, threshold as well as the neurological um, you know, speed that you're going at too, and the coordination there, that allows you to accumulate globally more time under tension. And we know that volume, time under tension, accumulation of a stress or a stimuli 
is the driver of adaptation. The more of that you can get without requisite breakdown, the stronger signal it sends to the body, the more the adaptive enzymes can do their work, provide you give them appropriate uh, recovery and restitution afterwards, and then the better you get. I mean, that's what it is. <laughs> I mean, that's what it is. <laughs> I, I, there you go. Confusion that, cleared up, everybody. <laughs> there we go. I, and, and that's what it is. And I, I, think, I think here, you know, this is why... I'll give you an example is way back when I was looking at this stuff, I actually had, you know, measured lactate and stuff And my friend and I, my trading partner and I, we found that you could get pretty close to understanding where you were in this kind of lactate dynamics by just listening to your breath and understanding when you could talk or not. Right. It's like, we even had, we even knew like what phrases we could say, you know, I forget them exactly, but we had this thing was like, if you can't get these words out without needing to breathe again, you're going too hard. Right. And, and I think that's the beauty of this. And actually, you know, this is what I try to do as coaching as, or when I'm coaching is like, um, threshold runs, tempos, all that stuff. I'd often run with the athletes and then just talk to them and see if they could reply back and listen to their breathing. And often that would give me the indicator of like, oh man, you're going too hard. You're about to cross this. You're crossing this threshold. Like we need to chill you out. Mm -hmm. And what we learned from Backen's work, Norwegian's work, and they were, they were, you know, Ingerbritsen's like, they're more into measuring to make sure that we know like, oh, I'm okay. But I think for most of us, you can get 95% of the way there. If you listen to your breathing and you understand, you know, can you talk or not at these different phases? Oh, 100%. I mean, this is what Mike Smith means by moving oxygen. Like this is why he is not distracted during workouts. He's listening to athletes' lab degree of labor in their breath in between intervals, right? And, or when they come by. Like he wants to hear that because the more labored the breath, the closer or further beyond the anaerobic threshold you are. And that's, again, the thing is what the polarized training model is trying to discover through just observation, because that's really what the model is based on, observation of what elite athletes, endurance athletes are doing. They're not necessarily making any kind of like profound, you know, cataclysmic new insights. They're saying this is what people are doing, and so we're going to call it this. It's that, you know, uh, sub, I, I don't even know what they call it. He called, I think he's gotten it down to like two zones now. <laughs> it used to be five zones and three zones and two zones, whatever. The, the reality is, it's like a lot of training happens at the sub maximum, what I would call it sub sub maximal or intermediate or even moderate level. And we often think that there's only fast and slow, like recovery runs at nine minute pace or like balling out at, you know, reps at mile or 3k pace but it's this in between where you can actually get a lot of work done and then what Lydia was talking about getting the quote-unquote tireless state where you recover very rapidly from this stress exposure where you don't have this global fatigue hangover that lasts for days and even hours right because again it's this weird sweet spot that Mary's back and found out and just to the extent of how important it is like if you look at Hisham Melgarus's training he would always preface his training with about twice a day for his, you know, kind of um, basic or general endurance block twice a day runs for 30 to 45 minutes continuous at anywhere from 545 to 445 pace because he was riding what's called that AT, right? That, that threshold spot. Oh, and if you look at Mary's Beckham's website now, right? Co in Co's training of him, send him a pre-competition or base phase training where it's like, all right, Monday, you run nine miles at six minute pace. Tuesday in the morning, four miles at 5.15 pace. Tuesday in the afternoon, three miles at 5.10 pace. Wednesday, seven miles at 5.45 pace. Repeat. <laughs> Repeat for the rest of the week. Just go back through that cycle. And so now you're like, oh, snap. That's training. Daily, hard running, quote unquote. But it's this weird, moderately hard. And then we kind of like pulled the wool over people's eyes and called it long, slow distance because relative to how fast we were running intervals on the track at mile speed or 800 meter speed, this kind of speed at six minute pace or five ten pace for a male was quote unquote deemed slow. 
but it's not slow. <laughs> it, you're moving. You're like, you're moving. And that's the whole point is to understand like how to do this um, versus just making it in a continuous run. And that's the only, cause like you're going to, you're going to blow up if you try to do it continuously for like 10 miles. Right. And the, the prescriptions were very precise with Marius too. He's like, he found about 60 minutes globally accumulative in one session was good. And then you could get that. If you're doing doubles, you could get in the second session, another 30 minutes, but, but here's how he would dose it. Right. The first session in, of the threshold session in the morning, that would be about six minutes to three minute intervals with about 60 to 90 seconds recovery in between the intervals. So you're getting an hour going at, you know, a mile to K with 60 to 90 seconds standing rest, right? And then you come back in the afternoon and you do something like 25 times 400, right? Same pace, same effort, same intensity level with only 15 to 30 seconds rest. So, right. So now we're going basically 60 seconds, 30 or 15 seconds. That's the session. Those are the two sessions. But everyone's like, what? No, if you stop running, and this is why people run in place at stop signs <laughs> or stop lights, then all of a sudden everything turns off. It's like, no, it doesn't. The body is not that fast. <laughs> it really is not. It's not that fast to respond. No one ever said you had to run it continuous. No one ever did. <laughs> it, it, exactly. And that's why if you look at, for example... We'll pull up uh, a presentation that Gert Ingerbritsen gave, so the father, on their training. Staring at, at it right now, what do you see as one of their standard threshold sessions? Morning, four by six minute threshold. Afternoon, 20 by 400 threshold. I've never even seen this document. First time I ever heard about it. <laughs> no, I know. That's FYI. <laughs> that's what I mean. I mean, like you start saying that, I'm like, oh, I'm going to pull up this obscure, you know, and it's in Norwegian. So I had to, I had to look up the uh, word for threshold. I, I assume that's what it meant, but it says terskel. And guess what? Guess what terskel translates to according to Google Translate threshold. So so there, there you go. Um, but you know, the point is, this is like, this is how you develop, you know, when you go back all the way back to Peter Coe says four to five AT threshold runs a week. This is how you get that stuff in. Now, am I saying like everybody needs to go to this model? Not necessarily, but as, as back and said himself, like if you can combine Coe and Lydiard, that's what you, that's where the gold is saying. And we're saying, you know what, in the U.S., what we often do is look at this traditional model of threshold as 20 minutes, 25 minutes, 30 minutes at this stuff. And what Backen found, what the Ingerbritsons are showing, what the skater Vanderpool that you mentioned are showing is that like, yeah, yeah, that's one way to do it. But guess what? We can get more accumulated volume with less stress if we do it broken up in this manner and one of the ways i love to do it actually with with my athletes is kind of like giving them the choice and doing it fartlek style so for example i started this long ago with high school kids but i would say you know what today we're spending 20 minutes at threshold this morning but guess what you get to decide how you split it up and i would tell them here's what i want you to do i want you to start the threshold get in your effort before you get to that point where your breathing starts to go in the wrong direction and you can't talk or what have you i want you to stop at any sign that you're going to go to that i want you to stop jog around for a minute or so then start again you can split it up however you'd like you can do it randomly and that's what would often happen we'd have kids come back and be like well, I went eight minutes and 30 seconds for the first bit. And then I felt like my breathing was about to get out of, over, out of control. So I stopped for a minute. And then I went five minutes and 30 seconds the next one. And then blah, 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 until I got to 20. I said, great, fantastic. And I think what you're doing there is taking a little of the stress out of the workout too. Because what I noticed from a psychological standpoint is if you told someone, hey, we're going to go do a five or six mile threshold run today. Hmm. It's almost like you get a little anxiety. Oh, dude, I yeah. fucking hated them. 
<laughs> right? I hated because them. You're just like, oh god, like those are the is, hardest shits I ever did, man. The this is for ever. like, you know, you're like, all right, for the next five miles, I'm gonna have to be riding this line and focused. And like the last couple miles is like, yeah, I'm gonna be a little more fatigued, but it's really that mental aspect of like, oh, it's gonna be a grind to stay on pace, et cetera, to get. Like this you have through. to will yourself to do it. Yeah. And coach well, would be like, oh, it's an easy session. Like, no, this is the hardest fucking session of the week, dude. Yeah, <laughs> it's tough. So what happens is you change it and you say, you know what? You can do the same volume, but you know what? We're going to do them in miles, you know, five by mile or whatever, 10 by K, whatever it is, or by minutes and say, you know what? We're just splitting up short rest. Just stay in the effort. Just keep, keep going. You know, you might get a little bored because, you know, this is long, but that's fine. And all of a sudden, it takes some of that fear away where you're just like, okay, no, this isn't going to be a grinding session. This is actually going to be kind of a moderate session, like the coach is saying. Like, I don't have to be crazy focused. This isn't going to get out of control. We're all good. The other thing that often happens is if you say five miles at threshold, what happens is it gets out of control for somebody because either the top guy's like, okay, I'm going to crank it down because I feel good. Yeah. Or... Everybody else is hanging on to dear life because they don't want to be dropped from the path. Yeah. And that's the problem too, is the fact like the way we're measuring, we or we measure in the West, the efficacy of the threshold session is through predominantly the pace. We started to now kind of, you know, do the heart rate. And then now some people are really nerdy and like, you know, geek out on lactate. But we lost sight of it is coupled with breath, right? And when that breath becomes overly laborious, that's when you know it's not good. And and yet people get these weird complexes about pace in training. Remember, the goal in training is only one thing and one thing only. Subject the athlete to the desired stimulus to get elicit a reaction that will then create an adaptation. No one ever said the pace has to be better than the week before. We just made that up. It totally is a makeup thing, right? But we have all these complexes about the status and currency regard to pace and pace and training and using that as the end all be all. And as Steve and I have talked about many times, weather, nutrition, hydration, your general well-being or lack thereof can radically influence your pace, right? Well, you know, the other thing that I would say, and this is a lesson I had to learn is like, if you live in Houston, Texas in the summer, guess what happens to your threshold training? <laughs> it, it, you know, I will, I can literally tell you, having tested this on lactate levels, like if normally my threshold was quote unquote around five minute pace, in the summer it would be like five twenty five, <laughs> like no joke, like it's just like your disaster. And guess what? In the summer, if you try and ride that line and do your 25 minutes, 30 minutes at threshold, guess what? Even if you stay on the new pace and are running like 525 pace, it's still a disaster because your body, your heart rate is going up because of cardiac drift. Your lactate levels will actually go go up and increase even if you're quote unquote below threshold because you're doing so much work to cool the body down and it's not working because it's humid as hell. So this is why even this is why I learned very quickly. It's like, oh, forget this stuff. Like, split this thing up, man. We are splitting it up. And if you do that, you often get better bang for your buck. This is why uh, I'll give you two more examples. Is I was talking to um, someone who actually uh, a couple of weeks ago tra- trained like the uh, the Navy SEALs and Special Warfare and all that stuff, right? And they were telling me about their program. It was a great program. It was like running is really important to us. And it was like, essentially what we do is easy runs. We have one day at kind of like a moderate interval thing. And then we have like one threshold, you know, workout. And I was like, well, what's the threshold? And he was like, always fart, like never, never tempo, like, or never like the sustained tempo. And it's like, you got to remember these guys aren't quote unquote runners, but the fart lick allows them to stay in the right spot. It prevents them from doing dumb stuff or from overcooking it. And I think that is like the genius of going back to fart lick, but that's what it allows us to do 
So, and we got away from that into this more controlled, like tempo thresholds type style, which every once in a while can be fine. Don't get me wrong, especially if you modulate it right. But if we could bring more of that kind of like natural fart lick or controlled fart lick to it, we're able to handle our higher volumes, more quote unquote time under tension, which gives us a better adaptation. Yeah, it's interesting because, you know, this demonization of interval training happened around Lydia's time. And he was demonizing strict, rigid adherence to interval training by being overly prescriptive on the pace, overly prescriptive on the recovery. Then it became really monotonous and regimented, right? And the reality is people then swung the other way and became overly strict and rigid on the idea of continuous training. <laughs> <laughs> when interval training is really, really freaking valuable. Why? Because what a lot, the rest in its name for the relief period or the relief interval that falls the work um, rep is it allows the essentially like coming down or abating of all these chemical reactions to give you a little relief. So it doesn't uh, compound and accelerate as quickly. And that's what happens in a race, right? Is there's compounding acceleration of fatigue. But if we can get more time under tension, and that's all we want to think about, right? What's better, a better stimulus? 60 minutes of the threshold training that done in interval style with very short, you know, and appropriate um, modulated intervals or 35 minutes. I'm going to take the 60 minute every time, every time, <laughs> right? It, it, exactly. <laughs> and it allows us, again, going back to that Mary's backing quote, who said, like, riding that line is very hard stimulus being just below is something that you can do over and over again. Yeah, let, this is good. Actually, let me read from page 10 in uh, the Niels uh, Vanderpool um, training thing. He talks about his transition to threshold training or threshold season, as he calls it. So he has these discrete seasons, these block periodization seasons. The first one's aerobic season, which is, a, again, aerobic capacity running. So when you think about aerobic capacity work, he's doing it all on the bike. He's not running. The best way to think about aerobic capacity is we often talk about this word easy. There's recovery and there's easy. And the way to distinguish it, right, is recovery is running that is below that quote unquote um, aerobic threshold where we start to cross what is deemed from the world of averages, the two uh, millimol, you know, uh, uh, lactate production. So when we're talking about aerobic capacity we're like just above that we're just above like 2.1 to maybe 2.5 right so that's where a lot of the aerobic capacity work is being done not recovery running which is below that which is just getting the blood flowing with no aerobic enzyme stimulus right above so that's he prefaces uh this season this block of training with a aerobic capacity block where he's getting about 30 to 35 hours on the bike of that um, type of riding or cycling or stimulus. So now he goes into threshold season. Now threshold season is the Norwegian concept of threshold season where he's trying to get about, if we're, again, we're going on these hypothetical 2.0, 4.0 millimol models, he's now in the wanting to be in the threes, so to speak, but not too high end of the threes, lower end of the threes, right? So again, aerobic capacity in the twos, low to middle twos, threshold training, the threes. All right. Here's what he says. I started the threshold season in August. It lasted approximately 10 weeks. I dropped the hours from 35 hours of training to 25 hours weekly and tried to do as many of these hours on threshold as possible. It was important not to start off too hard. So I just made a smooth transition from going from aerobic to reaching higher levels of weekly threshold hours. I started the threshold season with sessions like, and this is on the bike, six times, eight minutes, a few times a week, and increased the load as rapidly as possible, which is, again, a product of block training, really smart, uh, reaching eight hours weekly with sessions like four times 30 minutes, six times 15 minutes. So see, he's still interval style on the bike with this, quote unquote, what we consider medium to higher end threshold work. I tried to do more than eight hours a week a few times dot, 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 dot. It always, always backfired. I usually went a little under four mil moles in order to increase the total threshold mole. I do believe that going above four mil, um, going below four mil moles instead and lowering the hours just a tiny bit might have been just or 
perhaps as more effective. I did my thresholds on the bike because of the similarity to speed skating and for its easy measurement in watts. Being able to clearly see the development over a time period was very motivating, but also necessary in order to manage the training loads. So we have it right there, right? He understands like there's this sweet spot where you want to be in the threes, but if you start to crank beyond it and do too much accumulation of time, right? And he starts to creep up above the four, it's just going to backfire. Because why? The stress hormones, right? You're just, you're, you're too much in the cortisol, catabolic, inflammatory state. Your body can't, you know, bounce back quickly. There you go, folks. I mean, so, <laughs> so, so the reason I say there you go is we've now, what I hope you're saying is this, is we're connecting Norwegian speed skating, Ingerbritsen model, Mary's back in from two decades ago now. Yeah. P- Peter Ko, Arthur Lydiard, Igloy. Pavel and- Nurmi with Fartlek. <laughs> but yeah, Pavel, we're going all the way back. <laughs> but showing you like, where this comes from and why it actually works now the one thing i'll say here is that like we've talked about back and saying you know 30 percent of mileage or whatever it was there all of that is variable we're not saying there's anything perfect on on like you know these specific guides but what we are saying is that consider this model of replacing some of your traditional threshold type tempo runs with some of this more interval fart like style just below which i get it's hard with high school or college kids who want to push it but doing that can can work well and then i also uh, what i would say is if you look at anger britson and even even to degree back in and, and certainly co is what they often would do anger britson would have these combined workouts where you know, as they're transitioning into, uh, you know, competition phases where they do some threshold, whatever it is, four by six minute or whatever, and then finish with five by 200, where they're just getting a taste of running faster, right? Where they're saying, you know what, I'm not going to crank these crazy, but it's time to get down to 1500 pace. Like, let's do stuff like that. And I'm a big fan of combining, you know, especially as a transition combining some threshold work in this manner, fartlek work with some sort of, hey, let's touch on getting faster a little bit. And this is actually what what Canova often does in his kind of double workout days where he might test touch on like threshold in the morning and then come back with a little more, but then like something in the different direction in the afternoon. So you're getting, again, these combined kind of stimulus in different directions to maintain things. Yeah, let's talk about that real quick, because that's really a tried and true um, setup. You know, Gags and even Vin Lanata use that concept of doing like a tempo run in the morning and then like fast 300s in the afternoon. Now, why? Why that construction? Well, you know, if you look at purely through a neurological model, you would say, hey, we want to do speed before, quote unquote, this aerobic stuff, right? And it's like, yeah, it's true. But we have to consider a lot of things other than that, right? One is um, we know that for things of higher um, neurological demand, like weightlifting, strength conditioning, our bodies are actually more prepared to do that in the afternoon because hormonal peaks have happened. We're also well-nourished. We have a lot of food in us. We have a lot of energy. We have a lot of things preloaded in the body versus in the morning, we're not quite quote unquote turned on for that um, high higher end, like neuromuscular recruitment stimulus, right? Now, by doing something that's a controlled amount of threshold, not, and this is the key word here is controlled. You're not overly doing it. You're just getting enough to just get a little bit of a support stimulus, not a loading stimulus. There's a big difference here, right? When like, say, Brad Hudson in his training models talk about aerobic support, the stimulus that's being offered is to maintain not to develop. So that's a key thing here too. You kind of understand why those threshold sessions are quote unquote short in the morning is they're maintaining stimulus, a maintenance thing. The developing stimulus is the afternoon speed session. And so the rather than, because you could also go, right, if you did in one session, the fast stuff first, the threshold stuff second, 
but the reality is if you do it like that instead of you know breaking it up you will incur a little bit more of a global um, fatigue response because now you're mixing this really fast new developing stimulus that you really want to hit hard but then also trying to maintain this threshold um, stimulus but now the session just gets longer <laughs> Like the whole thing, it's just longer. It's just longer to do. And we, as coaches, we always got to think about the cost benefit analysis here of like, well, we, yeah, we could fit it all in, but now this session takes two and a half hours versus having two one hour sessions, right? Of training with a recovery, an acute recovery period in between where the athlete can hydrate, eat, rest, maybe take a little bit of nap, get a little like micro uh, rejuvenation. So it's important to understand the benefit of that. And it's interesting too, if, I, I, my wife, she was, um, did a, a session with some fellow runners here, uh, female runners a couple of weeks ago, and they were running that exact model. They did like six by 1200 in the morning at threshold with 60 seconds recovery. And then the late, then, uh, the group of ladies came back and did like 10 times 200 fast on the track at, you know, mile or three K or whatever. My wife didn't do the afternoon session. She only did the morning session. And it was interesting because the response from the athletes who did that, it was a training session. They felt the next day like flat, tired, fatigued, you know, the stimulus like did his job. She didn't do the afternoon speed work, only the morning threshold thing just ran easy in the afternoon um, because again, she was just joining them and it was, you know, different things going on. We look at her HRV, her recovery profile the next morning through the roof, Re high readiness, ready to go, felt great. I was like, all right, let's go. And it shows you like two lactate. And we have, again, we have these very interesting studies done on tendons um, in vitro by on um, in research. And it shows that this lactate accumulation does accelerate recovery. But again, as we saw with Mary's back and, and then applied here with uh, Neil Vanderpool, it's like, there's a sweet spot. We can't get too much of it because you might get more lactate in, but that more lactate also then comes with more, um, you know, negative hormone release. So it's this, it's this, it's this treading water, which is always, always, always shows you it's, you know, valid and truth because that's one of mother nature's like, right. Laws is everything in moderation, <laughs> <laughs> the middle path, right? That's how we know it is correct because it's, it's right there smack in the middle. <laughs> that's, that's right. The middle path. I know. But Love you'll it. even see that like um, it makes more sense in light where it's like I've talked about before, even having these aerobic flushes, right? Where it's like athletes run 200 meters at a very 10K pace, 15K pace, and then 200 meter jog after you do a really taxing what we the old timers yeah. would call anaerobic session to create some flush, we're creating some more lactate dumpage. And then everyone ultimately feels better acutely right then and there. And then also intermediately from day to day. And now it's like, oh, that's why that works. <laughs> oh, that's why like six to eight by 200 meter flushes work because it encourages this lactate production, which then stimulates and it accelerates better recovery. Yep. Lactate, the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> Yeah, you, you gotta love it, man. You gotta love how uh, how it all kind of fits together. I know when you connect the dots, it's so freaking cool. So you know, there you go. This is this is what I would call a connect the dots podcast. And this and is what we do on the daily in the Scholar Clubhouse. We connect those dots. Come that's on. right. So if you enjoyed this, you're gonna love the clubhouse. You're gonna love the Scholar program where we go deep on stuff. So consider signing up, checking it out. Promise, as I said, the emailer at the beginning, you won't be disappointed. You're gonna be shocked and awe by the the goods that you get. Honestly, so, like the th biggest thing is, I'm so surprised at our retention rate. You know, like yeah. in the beginning when we were kind of figuring out what we we're doing, it would be like you know, very you know lot churn but now our retention rate is like through the roof i'm like man people are sticking with it because the value's there that's that's why. right that's what we're all about giving more value so check that out we hope you enjoyed this podcast if you liked it share it with a friend share it with someone who needs to learn about lactate threshold training and the true and maybe someone who's obsessed with the norwegian training understand where it came from 
go deep. That's what we do here. So we appreciate you listening. We appreciate all of our everybody taking the time out of their day to to listen to our work. So until next time, everybody, keep on coaching, keep on running.